Good morning. My name is Jennifer Berg. Please open your Bibles to Romans 13, verses 11 through 14. Follow along with me as I read. It is page number um, 1763 in the Blue Bible. And do this, understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber, because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over, the day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. Well, good morning once again. Wasn't that uh, youth conference video great? Isn't that cool? I feel like we should have clapped at the end of that and just said, yeah, so good. Good to see what God is doing um, in our children and youth and our older adults and everybody in between. Uh, so much cool stuff to be part of and see God growing us and um, receiving glory. Romans 13.11 begins, and do this, understanding the present time. By this, Paul is referring back to everything from chapters 12 and 13. For those of us who are part of E3, that means everything that we've been learning about all the way back as far as January 7th at the beginning of this year, Paul's pointing back to those things. Over the last two months, we have learned about worshiping God with our lives. Worshiping him first by offering our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, which is our true and proper worship. We've been about learning about worshiping him with our spiritual gifts as one body with many parts, each of us doing our part to serve here in the church body. Learning about the distinguishing marks of a follower of Christ, how there are certain attitudes and attributes and actions that are part of what it means to be a child of God and to follow Jesus as a devoted follower. Overcoming evil with good, not repaying anyone evil for evil, but instead trusting God, trusting that he will eventually make all things right. We've been learning about subjecting ourselves to the governing authorities, that the authorities who are in charge are people God has put in place as his servants for our good. And we've learned about loving our neighbors as ourselves, how this fulfills God's law, how this continues to pay toward our outstanding debt of love for one another, to love all peoples. And all these things have been building toward here this verse 11. Paul wants us to do this, all of this, in light of our understanding of the present time. So whatever he means by the present time is pretty important. It's meant to be compelling. It's meant to be what is motivating us toward all this Christian living and Christian service. Now, by present time, Paul isn't referring to the specific time that this letter was written, approximately A.D. 57. That's not what he means by the present time. What he's driving at here is the present time within God's salvation history. The point in history that humankind is at in God's master redemptive plan throughout all time, the present time is a very compelling time. And we need to understand that. Understand the sobering reality that we are living in the final chapter of history before Christ's return. Before we dig into that anymore, would you please pray with me? Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the ways that you are at work in and through our church and in and through our individual lives as followers of Christ. And we pray this morning that you might help us to understand your word. Whether we're here as a follower, whether we're here as someone who is just seeking truth and hasn't decided to follow yet, but we're curious or wondering, Lord, would you open our eyes to see this truth? Give us ears to hear eyes to see, 
Holy Spirit, would you help us now, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Understanding the present time motivates believers to wake up and put on the armor of light. Or perhaps I should say, wake up! I had somebody before the first service come to me and say they were having a cup of coffee so they wouldn't fall asleep during the sermon. And I said, oh, don't worry, I'll shout out at least one time for you and help you stay awake. So hopefully there weren't any infants sleeping just now. Romans 13, 11 to 12. And do this, understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. There's an anticipation, an expectation. The day is almost here. When Paul says, wake up from your slumber, he's confronting the Christians in Rome, confronting the fact that they are spiritually asleep, that have, they have grown morally lazy, and they're slumbering. And he's really calling out anyone, anyone who considers themselves a deeply devoted follower of Jesus, but who's grown apathetic to the gospel message, who's grown indifferent to the Great Commission mandate. He says, put on your armor. There are things to do. The salvation which is nearer now isn't referring to simply our initial salvation, but our final salvation. When all of salvation will be completed in a way that we have not yet experienced it fully. We've been completely saved, but our salvation, there is still more to come, a glorification that is ahead of us. Our salvation, which will be fully completed when Jesus returns for his bride, the church, when he returns for his followers, and when he rewards those who have been faithful to him. That's the day we're looking forward to. God the Father has set a particular time for his son's return. And Paul's reminding us that that particular time is getting closer and closer and closer. In verse 12, the night. The night stands for the present evil age, which is nearly over. It's about to come to its final end. And then the day is referring to the wonderful day of our Lord's return. The day when Christ will come back to this earth. It's almost here. Getting closer. Paul's reminding the believers that this present day world is not our final home. We are sojourners. We are on a journey and this is not our final resting place by any means. So much more to come, so much more ahead. And we are now approaching the far right end of the timeline. We're getting closer and closer to the end of that timeline, which is stretched out for many thousands of years. But now we're getting very close to the far right end. Therefore, it's vital that we understand the present time in which we live. With what time remains, we must live in light of this reality. And if we've fallen asleep spiritually, we need to wake up and put on our spiritual armor. Verse 12 goes on, the night is nearly over, the day is almost here, so let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. This call to put on our armor is a call to action. It's a call to battle, a call to Christian living. There are things to do. We're not in our pajamas going to sleep. We're putting on our spiritual armor, the armor of light. And as we wake up, we need to do these things that we've been talking about in chapters 12 and 13. We need to stop conforming to the patterns of this world. We need to serve faithfully with our gifts. We need to embrace godly attitudes, godly actions. We need to overcome evil with good. Wake up and do that. Be subject to our governing authorities. And we need to love our neighbors as ourselves. Wake up and do those things to which God has called us, for which we are armored in the armor of light. Understanding the present time. 
We need to live out the powerful potential of our Christian lives. And if we had time, we could turn to Ephesians 6 and we could talk about the full armor of God. We won't do that this morning, but this week you may want to take a peek. All kinds of armor that God has provided us. As the Apostle Paul continues to write this letter here to the believers at the church in Rome, he now moves to the topic of personal holiness. And that's really what this morning's text is focused on. Personal holiness. Among other things, those of us who are becoming deeply devoted followers of Jesus, we need to wake up and stop sinning. Understanding the present time motivates believers to put aside the deeds of darkness and behave decently. Verses 12 and 13 go on. So, Let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. And to be clear, when Paul says, let us put aside the deeds of darkness, he's addressing Christ followers. He's addressing the Christians in Rome, and by default, he's addressing us here today. Those of us who claim to be following Christ. Paul illustrates this now with yet another aspect of night and day. He now speaks of dark and light. With darkness being not so much a marker of time, but a marker of sin. There's a Bible scholar named Douglas Moo. He explains it this way. The ancient world without electricity to keep cities lit at night viewed darkness as the time of evil and corruption. Criminals could carry out deeds under cover of night and escape detection. So it was natural for people to associate evil with the nighttime. Hence, Paul can call on us to put aside the deeds of darkness and behave decently as in the daytime. Believers are to have nothing to do with those activities conducted in the dark. Wild parties, excessive drinking, and sexual misbehavior. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read verse 13 and I see Paul being so blunt here, it's kind of jolting to read that. I mean, is there really that much of a problem with these kind of sins? In the church? So really, that many of us who are struggling with carousing and drunkenness, with sexual immorality and debauchery, with dissension and jealousy? Apparently, at least in the church in the first century, the church in Rome, there were some issues. Paul had enough concern that he states it explicitly. He just lays it out there. And the fact is, if you read through the New Testament, you read Paul's letters, you'll find that he is often confronting blatant sin in the local churches when he writes to the Christians. So let's not be naive about sin. Let's not pretend, let's not play a game as though sin is no longer a struggle or an issue. Let's not put on an arrogant facade as though we are holier than thou. And, you know, here at Ephri Bemidji, that would just never happen. This kind of stuff doesn't even apply to us. Let's not do that. Instead, let's take sin seriously. Let's think about this. Let's address it honestly. Be mindful of it. Confess it. Repent of it. Turn away from the deeds of darkness. Psalm 32, 3 through 5 says, When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you. Did not cover up my iniquity. 
I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. So rather than pretend that these kind of sins could never happen to any of us, let's be real. Let's take God's word to heart by putting aside the deeds of darkness. Let's apply this sobering admonition to behave decently by resisting these kinds of sinful behaviors which are completely unfit for followers of Jesus. Sinful behaviors in the life of a Christ follower are exactly opposite of the distinctive marks of a Christian that we talked about a few weeks ago. Complete contrast. So I feel compelled to say this to anyone here who may be hearing this message, that if you yourself are, are not a follower of Christ, but you know someone who claims to be a follower of Christ, and that person is actively sinning without any remorse, without any regret, without any repentance, then you need to know that that is not the way the Christian faith is meant to be. God desires holiness for his people, which is why he provided it through Christ. He desires holiness for his people, and he empowers us, and he equips us to live out that holiness. His Spirit enables us to live a radically different life than everyone around us. So, the Christian person you're watching who is living in these sinful ways, they either need to genuinely repent of that sin and put it aside and turn away from it, or they need to come clean and say, you know, I guess I don't really want to follow Jesus after all. We're currently in the season of Lent. Lent is intended to be a season where we grieve over sin, where we are honest and we mourn over sin and we confess our sin and our need for forgiveness. And since none of us will ever be able to live our lives perfectly, it sure is a good thing that we have a Lord and a Savior who advocates for us continually, who understands our struggle, who sees our need for help. 1 John 2, 1 reminds us, My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Jesus in heaven, beside the heavenly Father, advocating for us as we continue to pursue holiness, not perfectly, but our desire, our heart, our hope is to put aside the darkness and take on the holiness of that God has for us. One of the spiritual disciplines which is sometimes highlighted in the season of Lent is fasting. Fasting in combination with repentance and mourning over our sin can be a very effective weapon in our fight against sin. Fasting can actually increase our hunger for God, increase our appetite for God so that we desire Him more and more, more than anything else. We long for Him and we recognize our need for Him. We can't live by bread alone. We need a spiritual sustenance from the Lord. So perhaps some of us listening to this message today should consider a fast. Fasting from food or fasting from social media or fasting from something else, whatever the Lord might prompt in your life, in your heart. Perhaps it's something that's come between you and Him. Or perhaps it's just something that will help you to draw near to Him, to, to get a clarity and a focus that you need on your spiritual life. Fasting can be an incredibly helpful way for us to humble ourselves before God to plead with him, to help us find victory over sin. And so it's one way that we can draw near. Now, there are some other strategies for pursuing holiness, 
And they come in our final verse. Understanding the present time motivates believers to pursue personal holiness by clothing ourselves with Christ and thinking rightly. Verse 14 is a call to holy living. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. So verse 14 gives us two particularly effective strategies, clothing and thinking. First, let's look at clothing. Obviously, verse 14 isn't talking about literal clothing. We're not suggesting here that a proper dress code will be the key to to being a holy person. Clothing ourselves with Christ is a metaphor. It's a metaphor for putting on Jesus' righteousness, wearing the righteousness of Christ, remembering all he has done to overcome sin and purchase our victory over sin. And this kind of clothing stands in direct contrast to putting on deeds of darkness, gratifying the desires of the flesh. Flesh here is our sin nature, our old sinful self that keeps fighting for control within us, even for believers who have the Holy Spirit within us. That sin nature continues to vie for power, vie for control, to direct us towards sinful things. Our sinful flesh wants to take the reins, or at least to get us to submit to gratifying its desires, to feeding it a little bit here and there. Paul warns us, don't even think about it. If you give your flesh an inch, it'll take a mile. Don't even think about how to gratify those sinful desires. Pastor Timothy Keller points out that the clothes that we're wearing usually have an effect on how we behave. So if we put on formal clothes, a suit and tie or an evening gown and heels or whatever it might be, and we're probably planning to head out for a nice dinner or to some sort of fancy performance or a special play that we're going to. And if we put on running shoes and workout clothes, we're probably planning to go to the gym or out for a jog. With this in mind, we're also wearing these metaphorical clothes. And that clothing can have an effect on how we behave. What we're expecting to do while we're out in these clothes. And before a Christian jumps into sinful behavior, we take off the clothing of Christ. We remove that so that we can put other clothes on. We put on our clothes for carousing and drunkenness. These are my carousing clothes. We wear our clothes for sexual immorality and debauchery. Changing our metaphorical clothing is something that it happens in our mind and it happens in our hearts. Again, it's a metaphor. It's a a picture of how that happens in our heart and our minds. We wear this metaphorical clothing into sinful places. We wear it, we put it on when we're headed out to hang out with some sinful people who we know are going to drag us into sin and we're thinking we'll probably sin with them. So we change our clothes, so to speak, when we head over to their place. I appreciate how the English Standard Version translates verse 14. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. This includes making no provisions to be in sinful places. Proverbs 7 says, I noticed among the young men a youth who had no sense. He was going down the street near her corner, walking along in the direction of her house. At twilight, as the day was fading, as the dark of night set in. This young man is making provision for his flesh, for the sinful desires of his flesh. Rather than putting on Christ, we sometimes put on our clothes for going to sinful places. Rather than putting aside the deeds of darkness, we run straight for them. We make a beeline and head right over there. I don't know why we do that. I don't know why I sometimes do that. 
but it is regrettable. There are places designed for sinful behavior, whether they're places in the real world or places on the online world. Pursuing personal holiness also includes making no provisions to be with sinful people who we know are going to drag us down, who will tempt us toward unholy behavior. 1 Corinthians 15 says it this way, Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Come back to your senses as you ought and stop sinning. For there are some who are ignorant of God. I say this to your shame. Paul doesn't pull any punches. Back in my days as a youth pastor, I would often ask students, are your friends influencing you or are you influencing your friends? And I would say a similar thing to those of us here who are adults. Who is influencing who? Are you making an influence, pointing people to Christ? Or are other people pulling you away from Christ and influencing you? See, we're not saying here that all of our friends have to be Christ followers and perfect people. Not saying that. But we are thinking very carefully about verse 34. Come back to your senses as you ought. Stop sinning. If there are people dragging you down, you may need to take a break and walk away from that relationship. If we truly desire personal holiness, then we need to clothe ourselves with Christ and we need to remain clothed with Christ. To be wrapped in that as our garment, as our clothing. Not only is this an effective strategy, for avoiding our fleshly desires, but it's also an effective strategy for maintaining a godly influence with our lost friends and family. And we clothe ourselves with Christ because we know that it's only through Him, it's only through His righteousness that we have any shot at living a holy life. Now, a second particularly effective strategy for our personal holiness is our thinking. Romans 8, 5, and 6, we looked at this quite a few months ago. It reminds us, those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death. But the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace the good plans that God has for us, the blessings that he has for holy living. Personal holiness is a mindset. And not just a mindset, but a setting of our minds on the right things. It involves a conscious effort to not even think about what would gratify our sinful flesh, which is another way that we make provision for our flesh. But when our mind is set on the right thing, it makes absolutely no provision for that. No place for that. Verse 14 says, And do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. Battle against sin is a battle in our minds. It's a war that is waged with our thinking. And the admonition here in verse 14 echoes back to what we learned in Romans 12.2. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. So rather than thinking about ways to gratify our sinful desires, we should be instead thinking of ways to live for Christ, to live the abundant Christian life. Rather than making provisions for the flesh, we make provisions for godly living. The world that we live in is constantly barraging us with temptations towards sin. It invites us. It's, it's incessant. It's persistent in inviting us to join in on the fun. And by fun, what this world means is wild living, 
blatant rebellion against God and His holiness. That's the invitation. So it's vital for us as Christ followers, as we're living in the midst of the pattern of this world, to renew our way of thinking so that it's aligned with God's good, pleasing, and perfect will. We need to renew our minds with things like fasting, time in prayer, time in Scripture, time in Christian fellowship, and other things that will renew us in our faith, build us up. These are the kind of strategies for holiness that will help us to be the holy people God intends us to be. Now, for a good number of us who are listening to this message this morning, as we're talking about all this, it might not feel all that new. If we've been following him for a number of years, today's message might feel a little bit like Christianity 101. But if you think about it, the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, was led to record these words, to give this message, to bring this message to the Christians in Rome. And this message has been preserved for us for 2,000 years so we can see this message and consider it and think about how we need it as well. I'm guessing that all of us, including myself, may need this reminder about personal holiness more than we realize. The fact is, one of the reasons that so many of us stray, that so many of us get off track in our devotion to Jesus, is that we don't consistently embrace these simple, fundamental strategies. We don't embrace them the way we should. It's all too easy for us, after many years of following Jesus, to grow lazy, to fall asleep spiritually, to get overconfident and distracted in our faith, and we begin to let our personal holiness just slide. And we fall asleep. And if that describes any of us here today, we need to wake up, to spiritually wake up. Romans 13 has made it quite clear this morning. Understanding the present time, we need to do these things. Colossians 3 summarizes it this way. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways, in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we ask you for a distinct sense of conviction. We pray, Lord, that you would break down our denial and our rebelliousness. Lord, that you would give us an honesty before you. Lord, please forgive us for falling asleep in our spiritual lives. Forgive us for sinning against you after all you have done for us through Christ. By your Holy Spirit, please make us holy. 
by your Holy Spirit, empower us and enable us to put aside the deeds of darkness. Please make us holy as you are holy. We ask this together in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen.